Okay, let's do it. Let's go live. Hello, everybody. This is Jamie, Jamie Keddy, Lesson Stream founder. Lesson Stream is a community of teachers with a passion for using story in the classroom. And uh, many of the members are here. It's a very special event we've got uh, because I've got a very, very good friend of mine. Very good friend of mine. A frightfully good friend of mine, uh, Nick Bilbera. And uh, just before we continue, the drill is you've got to say hello. Say hello, Jamie. I can hear you. I can see you. Then I know it's safe to start and everything will be hunky dory, as they say. Hunky dory. So please say hello. Please say you can hear me. Please tell me that you can see me. You don't have to let me know I'm looking okay, although that is optional. I mean, you know, I'll take any any compliments I can get. I like I like compliments. I like any kind of mints actually. Figments, pigments, compliments, spearmints. I'm just gonna keep naming mints until somebody says, Hello, Jamie. I can see you and hear you. Otherwise, I fear that I'm speaking to a vast void, which is my my half of my room over there. But there you did it. Pia can hear me, can see me. Fantastic. That's S funny is being funny. <laughs> so listen, very special friend of mine, as I mentioned, Nick Bilbra. You'll know him, but if you didn't know him from his books, from his great books from for Cambridge University Press, one on dialogue activities, one on memory activities. Nick's taught me a lot. We've had a lot of great conversations. And uh, before I bring him onto the screen, let me show you what he looks like in a photograph. If you ever have the pleasure to sit and have dinner with Nick, this is what it looks like. That's me on the right, Nick on the left, enjoying a fine, fine meal in Ramallah in 2013. And, uh, and uh, this was the very beginning of the story that Nick's going to be sharing with us. Um, I think I just, I'm going to bring him on. Because what was the point of seeing a picture of Nick when you can actually get to meet the real Nick? Am I right, Nick? Whoops. That's not <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Nick. Actually, I quite like the picture because that, is that 10 years ago, Jamie? I had to work this out. I had to, do, you know, using the, the meta information, the digital photographs. Mm. And it turns out it was 2012. So it's 11 years. years. It was May wow. 2012. You know what? I forwarded that image. I mean, I forwarded the email to a friend in Gaza. And he screenshotted the um is that a word screenshotted he <laughs> made a screenshot of that image of me and he said little nick with the caption because he <laughs> just sort of noticed how different i am like my hair changed color for one thing you and, mean yeah. then then and now um it's oh, just for a... calling me up actually yeah <laughs> let's then look at you now. again yeah i think we're both quite different yeah yeah, we both got a few grey hairs, haven't we now? I, th I think we've probably got, I mean, I'm trying to look at you now, but you've, I've reduced you to a poster stamp. Let's bring you back. Let's put you, uh, You, yeah, uh, you look like you've got a good head of hair. Yeah. I I yeah. cheat, Nick, because although it looks like I've got a good amount of hair, all I need to do is, this is there, it's losing it very fast. It's all going at once. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, no one can see that though, can they? Unless they're very tall. That's the beauty of going bald there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can do, what was that guy called who used to? He was on a program called Family Fortunes. Do you remember that? And he used to brush his hair. He used to grow his hair really long, and then brush it over the top. I want to say it was Bob Monkhouse, but it wasn't Bob Monkhouse, was it? I don't know. No. Anyway. There, there have been many great homeovers in our yeah. time. Growing up in the seventies, as me and you did, we were the we 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 witnessed a lot of great homeovers from men who were not happy to part with their youth. Yeah, <laughs> a travesty of of justice. Really, you'd never see that nowadays, would you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'm bringing Nick to you with a good head of hair. 
Nick with a good head of hair. And where are you right now, Nick? You're in the West I'm Country, in, England. Yeah, I'm in Totnes, a place called Totnes. And if I look Which out I'm... my window, I can see a castle that was built in 1068. Oh, really? Don't tell me which one it is. Is it Edinburgh Castle? No. Which one is it? It's actually Totnes Castle. Ah, never have got that. I never, <laughs> never have got that. <laughs> 1068, did you say? 1068, yeah. They built it. You know, the Normans, they got a lot to answer for, haven't they? They were. In 66, they invaded. There was a big uprising here in the southwest. And they came and they built a castle right in the middle of the Saxon wall. Just wow. to, to defend themselves, just to kind of show them that they were in charge. They were incredible. I spent a lot of time in Norwich, and that's a very Norman, well, yeah. very Norman place, which came, um, well, came kind of out of that. No, it didn't. What am I talking about? I'm completely. <laughs> How did I get confused? To jump from the, the Saxons to the Normans. The Normans came and put the Saxons in their place, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 Saxons. Wait a minute. You're saying it's a castle. I'm going. The Saxons, this castle, was it a Norman castle we're talking? Yeah, it was a Norman castle. It was one of the first right. Norman castles that was built in Britain. Yes. Yeah, I think. And, we, yeah. Yeah. I did a, a yes. historical shift. Let's get on to your, because we could spend a lot of time talking nonsense, Nick. And I do love doing that. That's the danger of me and you getting together. Yeah. But uh, let, let's just, let me just continue contextualize this because nick and i went to to palestine it was my very first trip to palestine my one and only trip we were in the west bank a little british council organized trip took us to about four or five different cities it was a very very incredible uh, it's an experience i will never forget i'll never forget the vibrancy of the place the the warmth the friendliness the sincerity of the palestinians of the local people and we were all very moved by it we we're all very touched by it and, uh, and one of the things I remember was a, a teacher, a young teacher coming and saying, S thank you so much for coming to see us. Please don't let, ever forget about us. And that, that seems to have stayed with me. And Nick, it seems to have stayed with you because not long after that, you were straight back mm -hmm. in the region, weren't you? Giving yeah. your um, storytelling sessions. And yeah. there's a picture we're gonna just put on the screen here. And uh, whoops. This is this is it here. Tell us about this picture. Well, um, this picture actually this isn't in Palestine, but it's really where we can trace the origins of the Hands Up Project. This is actually in a refugee camp in northern Jordan for Syrian refugees. Um, it's called Zatari Refugee Camp, and it's a very crowded refugee camp and i was invited by the british council to go there not long after we met in palestine well we'd worked together in palestine and i was just invited to go and do storytelling projects all over palestine and mostly it was training teachers but then they said would you like to go to zatari and do some storytelling with some kids and i thought yeah i'd love to so i went and they put me in this room and the room was i just remember the room was absolutely packed with kids and i was sort of expecting to be kind of telling a story to a group of kids who were sitting down but it suddenly immediately felt like they were all telling the story with me everyone was on their feet throughout the whole telling of the story and i think i was telling um at this moment, I think I'm telling the story of we're going on a bear hunt, which I imagine lots of people know. Uh, the Michael Rosen story. The lovely story, really simple story and very easy to physicalize. So I was telling this story and everyone was standing up and doing actions to go with it. And then there was a boy who stood next to me and everything I said in english he translated it into arabic he just said everything in 
in Arabic straight afterwards. And I was, that was amazing, you know, that he was doing that. And I said to the lady from the British Council who was supporting me there, I said, wow, his, his English is, is fantastic. He understood everything I was saying and he kind of just translated it. And she said, oh, no, 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 he wasn't translating. He was just telling his own story in Arabic based on what you were doing. So he wasn't, he wasn't actually translating at all. He was just telling a story um, that kind of went with my actions. And I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> because well it sort of made me think about how really storytelling is it's not a passive experience is it listening to a story at all and I mean all of your work is is very tied in with that isn't it all of your work with um, you know picture telling and video telling and all of that kind of thing it's not a passive thing to to listen to a story even if you're not saying anything it's not a passive thing even if you're not moving it's not a passive thing because it's making you create lots of images in your mind and that was yeah it's a, yeah go on it's a roxy moron isn't it passive listening yeah listening is a very active and cognitive process it's a bizarre idea that we take with us sometimes yeah but i suppose it's very different from i don't know watching a cartoon on tv that is possibly more passive isn't it because you're sort of taking in the images and you can sort of sit back and accept the images yeah i guess yeah I mean, yeah what danger of this this is that's an interesting question but yeah. that that he's definitely making am i right in thinking that if you're using the story going in a bear hunt you were using the book i don't see it in the picture but no, a, that's no. true so maybe i've misremembered it maybe i'm telling a different story it looks like it could be a bear hunt <laughs> maybe i was just <laughs> telling it from memory yeah <laughs> Anyway, that was kind of where I I got interested in in um, in stories and the power of stories. And then I, I not long after that, I wrote this book. I was commissioned by the British Council to write Stories Alive, um, and I think it's one of the best things I've written actually. And it's certainly one of the books. It always thrills me when somebody somewhere in Palestine or somewhere around the world tells me, oh, they send me pictures of them using the material from this book with their students. I think that's kind of the ultimate um, accolade to, to, to you um, as a writer, to see people using your materials. So anyway, this book um, has some traditional stories in it, traditional Palestinian stories. Um, and it's got like pictures to go with each story and it's got um, a chant to go with each story and it's got a script that the students can act out, a simple theatre script that they can perform that goes with it and a summary, a written summary of the story that they can do things like put in order. Um, and this is a free to download book. I think we can put the link somewhere in the chat. So if, if anybody works with young learners, um, it's a resource. It's also got, you know, really nice pictures that go with it. Like I print them off on big paper. Um, <laughs> and, you know, this is a lovely story about um, a woman who gave birth to a cooking pot. It's a traditional... <laughs> Palestinian story and uh, that's a, you know it's quite a quirky little story and I love the artwork that goes with it as well but um, yeah so we got great to see we got some people joining us from Gaza Ashraf's here and Raja is here brilliant brilliant Okay, so 
Um, the link for that book is below, by the way, underneath the window, the uh, video window. So I've, I've linked it below so you can download that. Great, great. Um, what's the next slide? I've no idea. It's a nice picture. Oh, yeah. Well, whoops. Yeah, so as I said, that material was used a lot by um, teachers with their classes in Palestine. And that's from that book, that's how the Hands Up Project really started. So I started telling stories using that material to a group of kids in a library in Gaza. I was just doing it like once a week. And um, I thought I'd just do it alongside my regular job. I was working at a university at that time. And, um, but it just kind of grew, it kind of grew. More and more people got interested in doing sessions in their schools. And we started to get volunteers all around the world who wanted to join us. And we were using Zoom at that time. I mean, that was a time when nobody had heard of Zoom. Is it Zoom's <laughs> really early beginning? Um, but we used it because it would have some nice features that other that Skype didn't had, didn't have. Like you could share, you could share a screen and your video at the same time. I don't think you could do that with Skype. I remember um, you telling us about Zoom one day when we had you in the lesson stream for a, yeah. a webinar, and you said, "You've got to try this. Zoom's it's amazing. It's made our made our this whole project possible." And yeah, Zoom, what is the Zoom? Yeah. Well, it's also interesting because zooming. Was, I started. I used to do a lot of talks about things like zooming in and zooming out on language, and I kind of, I think I try to sort of apply that to my teaching that I do in a way. Like, you know, it's it's necessary. Sometimes we need to zoom in on language. We need to look at the detail of language. We need to look at the bits and pieces, the spelling and the pronunciation and the kind of nitty gritty of the language. And other times we need to sort of zoom out and look at um, the bigger picture and using language to communicate and express who we are and to understand the world. And that was really kind of also behind the ideas behind the Hands Up Project. So I think a lot of learners in Palestine um, experience being in a class, maybe not just in Palestine, maybe it's all over the world, lots of learners in classrooms experience looking, zooming in on language a lot, looking at the grammar, looking at the pronunciation, but they don't have so many opportunities to actually use language to talk about who they are and to understand the world. And that's kind of where we come in with the Hands Up Project. Um, and. And then it's interesting the book that you mentioned because I've, I've, there's a lot, the stories are very diverse. There's stories from, I remember once you told me a story about the farmer with the yeah. two lemon trees, and that's from the book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And also there's some more, sort of, there's some fable stories that we're probably more familiar with in the, in the UK. And so yeah. it's quite a mixture. You've 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 sort of shaken things up a bit, haven't you? Which is a very interesting way to do it. Which is a very yeah. lovely way of sort of making these connections. Which is yeah. is what it's all about. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. This story that's on the next slide. Do I am I able to share that? No, I'm not. I'm I think not. so. Um, give it a go. Well, this one here. It. Yeah. So this is from a sort of traditional Palestinian story called Jebena. And it's about, um, it's a kind of like a Cinderella story, really. Um, people are jealous of Jibena because she's so beautiful and they kind of play tricks on her. And she ends up, um, I don't know if Jamie's gone. Oh, you have No, I'm yeah. still here. I was oh, just messing. I was thought. <laughs> we can either go postage stamp size if we're both on the screen. Yeah. Or um or we can I can give you the floor. I was yeah. just giving you the floor, but I think you'd prefer me to be here. I think you said that at the start. I feel a bit lonely on my own, Jamie. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stay here. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you with my nonsense no. here. So yeah, so this is this this is the moment in the story where she's kind of been tricked by the bully women in the village. 
and she's left to look after the sheep and she's all dirty and the the rich um landowner comes across and sees her and says what do you he thinks she's his servant and he says go and look after the sheep and she ends up looking after the sheep and then this is one of my favorite moments in the story i love the kind of imagery here because um she starts crying and then the rain starts crying and the sheep start crying as well so there's the whole everything in the picture is crying and she washes away her everything's washed away so she's clean again and then the land at that point the landowner comes back and he falls in love with her just like that you know love at first sight because he sees or she's actually really beautiful and it's a you know it's an interesting moment in the story and it's a sort of i suppose it's a story that you can discuss what is beauty and whether you should marry somebody if they uh only are interested in your physical beauty and don't know you um and that kind of thing so here so what we used to do as i said these book these stories each story has a script so one of the things that we do with the scripts is we ask the students to practice them and perform them and sometimes they just did it in their regular classes and the beauty of them is you know sometimes people are put off doing drama because they think oh i've got to do a you know i've got to have lots of props i've got to have a stage i've got to get people to learn their lines and it takes a long time and we're talking about teachers who are very busy and work in quite challenging circumstances but the beauty of these scripts is they can just be used in a class you could just perform it in the class in front of the other students and so that quite often happened but then a brilliant teacher um who was with us right at the beginning of the hands up project called saha salha who works in jabalia refugee camp um she started saying we'd like to perform this play to you through zoom so she started performing the plays and this particular play jabena um you know they got it really good they they did it really well and the IATFL conference was coming up and I put in a proposal and I put in a proposal to do a live performance from Gaza to Glasgow it was 2017 2017 IATFL conference in Glasgow and five girls well we actually had two plays but there were five girls in this class and they performed the play through zoom to i don't know about 200 people in this huge auditorium and it's one of the a real landmark moment for me in the land in in the hands up project i mean i think it was probably i don't know this for sure but i think it was one of the first remote performances um from gaza certainly of a play i don't think anyone had ever thought of doing that before as a sort of language learning thing to perform it and there's a beautiful moment in the play when jabena the girl we can see there who's actually called zainab she had this inspired thought and she i didn't know she was actually going to do this but probably saha her teacher did but she came right up to the webcam this is the moment when the rich landowner has asked her if she'll marry him and she doesn't just decide yes or no she comes right up to the webcam looks at the audience and says what do you think should i should i marry him or not and it was amazing you know the whole audience were like shouting yes no and most people voted um i think yes the consensus was yes probably because we all want to have a sort of 
happy ending. Um, and uh, so she did marry him and they had, you know, it was beautiful. They had like confetti throwing down. They, they did it in a very, very creative way. And the audience loved it. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of in the Hands Up Project, one of the things that I love is that we've got kids who started working with us um, a long, long time ago, you know, um, when they were 12. Um, so when Zainab performed that, this is Zainab today. And she is now 20, I think, 19 or 20. And she's just started studying um, engineering at university in Gaza. So she didn't get married. She didn't marry the rich <laughs> landowner. Or she didn't marry anyone else. She decided to study and that's great. That is incredible because, you know, it, it must be, uh, I know you work incredibly hard at this and it does seem like, well, you were surprised it was 11 years ago that we we were having that dinner together and that photograph and to think that there's children that have grown up at the school yeah with the hands yeah. up project it must must be quite a an impressive uh it is an incredible yeah. feeling yeah yeah and and off you know they often say we've got a new feature on our website now called where are they now so we're taking different, we're showing students when they first started doing things with us and then showing them now and what they're doing now. It's very common that they say, um, well, that my English, it helped my English, but more common than that even is that they say things like, I really improved my confidence and I started to love learning English. And that's really important, I think. Wow. Is that performance the the Ayatollah one? Because you've got a very um, you've got a well looked after YouTube channel. You've got about six hundred videos yeah. um, of of many of performances from kids of the type that we we're just looking at. Yeah. Um, is that Ayatollah performance on the website on your YouTube channel? It is. Yeah. If you go to, I can't remember what the playlist is called for that one. I think it's called something like live performances or something but mm. um yeah we've got lots of playlists of plays um created and performed by palestinian kids yeah mm. Mm. and when so just the, the the connection aspect that you mentioned because you're giving them english to tell these stories put on these performances um, across borders and borders aren't just international i guess there's borders between gaza and the west bank is that possible is yeah well i mean we palestine is divided um and people who live in gaza can't go to the west bank and also people in the west bank can't go to gaza or they can't go without a permit um i mean yeah so it's it's very difficult i mean gaza is two million people oh i've gone i'm not sharing that. Right. too many cooks <laughs> the, two million people in in gaza which is <clears> a <throat> tiny tiny area isn't it and you've been there gaza, how many times oh i've been about 12 13 times yeah gaza is smaller than the isle of wight it's a tiny piece of land. It's one of the most densely populated places on earth, 360 square kilometers. And it's also a very, very young population. So on that picture there, you can see the, um, that's, that's actually Jabalia refugee camp from wow. above. I mean, you can just see how, densely populated it is and um but of course people live there and you know the first time i went to gaza it was um 
2017 was it i think and i went with scott thornbury and we went for a conference went to a conference for teachers that we were presenting at and it's amazing you go to gaza because i don't know i've never been anywhere before where donkeys are used a lot as a means of transport and ashraf's just corrected me there <laughs> two, two and a half million so half a million people have been born since i said that yeah ashraf is a is a english supervisor in gaza and a good friend and a great supporter of the hands up project nice to meet you ashraf um so yeah there's i mean this is a picture i just yes. Raja was born there. And Raja was born in Jabalia. Yeah. So Raja is our administrative coordinator in Gaza. And I'm sure she can actually possibly pinpoint which school this is. I don't know which school it is, but it's outside a school in Jabalia. And this is the school run. You know, this is a guy picking up his son from school and it's a donkey leap pulling a cart and so it was a big eye-opener for me when i when i finally got there and the other thing i mean the most powerful thing was that when i got there suddenly i could meet all of these kids that before i'd only seen online so i'd be doing online sessions with these kids for a couple of years <laughs> and suddenly you see them face to face i don't know if that's ever happened to you jamie you know I'm sure it has where you've met people online and then you meet them face to face. It's a kind of. Yeah, but in the numbers that you experience as well, you know, so many. I mean, it happens the odd person, doesn't it? You're working with perhaps. But uh, yeah, to that extent, I don't think I have experienced that sort of thing. Yeah. So this was um, Sally, Sally, a girl who I'd done lots of sessions with. And I finally met her when I went to Gaza for the first time. And she just ran up to us at the conference, Mr. Nick, Mr. Nick. And, <laughs> you know, it's really lovely, lovely to meet the kids. And Sally's another person who's kind of grown up with hands up. Um, in this picture, she's actually performing a chant. So one of the things that I like about this book that I wrote Am I allowed to say that? It's a bit... Of, of course you are. Show us. I am. Yeah. Hold it up. This yeah, is... That, that, that is Saha Salha's school. You're right. Uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, it's a question. I'm not sure if that's Saha Salha's school. All I know is it was in Jabalia, that picture. But um, So the book has these chants in it. And I've always loved chants because I think they're a really good way of kind of giving you a bit of an earworm for a bit of language, for a chunk of language. So each story, so here's a story called The Jackal and the Crow, which you might know as The Fox and the Crow. It's an Aesop's fable. And it's got this chant, and it goes something like this. The crow's so beautiful, the crow's so wise, with beautiful wings and beautiful eyes. The crow's so beautiful, the crow's so wise, with beautiful wings and beautiful eyes. The jackal's so bad, the jackal's so crude. He wants my dinner, he wants my food. The jackal's so bad, the jackal's so rude. He wants my dinner, he wants my food. And then the bit that Sa I remember Sally doing this part on her own, like the whole class, they had the whole class doing it for me and the, in the connection. And Sally was, do, was doing this line on her own. And it goes like this. And she, I mean, the interesting thing is when you write a chant, you kind of have a particular way of doing it that you have in your mind. But Palestinian kids are so creative and Palestinian teachers are so creative, they kind of turn them into songs. I'm going to try and sing it the way Sally sang it. So it goes like this. The most beautiful thing is the way that she can sing. The way that she can sing. The way that she can sing. The most beautiful thing is the way that she can sing. The way that she can sing. The way that she can sing. 
and maybe I'm wrong, but I'd like to hear a song. It goes on like that, but it was, it was lovely to hear something that you've written being reworked and coming back more beautiful. Um, so yeah, Sally's another student who kind of grew up with us, or grew up in the Hands Up Project, and she got really interested in um, doing plays. So that first trip to Gaza, um, often the things that we've done in the Hands Up Project, they've come out of a mistake or they've come out of a, something that we've seen people doing and we've just kind of built on it. So that conference that me and Scott went to in 2017 was really unusual for me because it started with a performance of a play by some kids. And they performed this play um, in front of all the audience and they were about 14 or 15. And I thought, wow, they must have lived in America or something because they had quite strong American accents, the, the kids. And, um, I, and I said, wow, that's amazing. And, and um, afterwards they said, no, those girls have never left the Gaza Strip. They've never been out of the Gaza Strip. And that's where we thought, we, me and Scott were on our way back to Jerusalem after the conference. We only stayed there for a day the first time. Um, <laughs> Ashraf says, can you start, can you keep singing? You, you're going to, re you regret that, I don't think. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? Like Rajah is saying, this chant inspired me to use language in chants with my first and third graders. Really good with, with younger kids. Um, to use those chants and kind of just kind of stick in their head the language. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Can't remember. Um, <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, um, yeah, I think just going back to that, it is the best technique to help students learn and memorize language. It's a really good technique, and you've got some nice chunks in there, the most beautiful thing. You know, it's a very generalizable chunk, isn't it? The most expensive thing, the most interesting thing, the most beautiful thing, you know. So it's, it's a lot of, you get some language for free, I think, when you do chants. You don't have to do much work and you just fix them in your head. Um, so Sally got interested. So we, we kind of decided, me and Scott, when we're on our way back, because Scott is a trustee of the Hands Up Project, um, on the way back, we decided that we would run a competition competition to make a play for kids in Palestine, to make a five-minute play, and it had to have a maximum of five actors in it. They had to create the play and perform it through a video, uh, you know, just take a video of it and send it to us, and send us the script as well. And then we had about, um, I think we had about 88, well, we had exactly 88 entries that year. And this was one of them. How do I, if I click share, do you want to just share it? I can't. I, well, sorry, this is the, the, the video. This is just a picture of them performing their play. It's not the video. It's no. not here. Sorry, yes. No. Yeah, it's just them performing their play. And... It's a beautiful play because it it shows um, it's about it's called Live Your Life, and it came third in the competition. And it's a play about three generations. You've got the two daughters, one of whom wants to be a designer, one of them wants to be a writer, and they're talking about their dreams and their grandfather is really encouraging them oh you know he's sort of saying i really hope you realize your dreams and then the mother who was played by sally there in the middle she was quite a sort of strict mother and she was sort of saying no i want you to be married by the time you're 20 i want you to be married and have kids and blah 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 and there were a lot of plays created by palestinian kids on that theme 
that theme of kind of early marriage and allowing children to realize their dreams. So that was the play they acted in. And then, you know, we we kind of got, we wanted to explore the idea of some of these plays being performed remotely as well. So I think the next year I was in Croatia, I was in Split at a conference in Split for teachers. And I was speak, I was giving a talk about drama and language learning. And we decided to ask the girls in Gaza if they would perform this play through Zoom to the audience. And again, it was like a beautiful moment. They they performed the play. It wasn't a very good connection, but it kind of didn't matter in a way because they acted so confidently and clearly and the message came across. And one of the nice things about doing this kind of remote theater is we give the kids an opportunity afterwards to come up to the webcam and talk to the audience about the experience. And here's another kind of landmark moment, I think, when Sally came up to the webcam and she spoke about the experience. And I want to read to you what she actually said. I'm not going to play the video, but I just... This is what she said about, about her play. Um, this is for about 200 teachers, mostly from Croatia, but from all over the Balkans. And she said, we wanted to convey a message through the play. The message is this. Listen to your children. Let them dream and enjoy every moment of their lives before it's too late. Don't let traditionalists destroy their hopes. And I just thought, you know, that's pretty cool, isn't it? For a 14-year-old girl in Gaza to tell an audience, to give advice to an audience of adult teachers in another part of the world. Um, when was this? Sorry, Nick. When did this? I think this was a few years ago, right? This was in 2018, autumn 2018 in Split. So, she, yeah. so five years later, she's... Do you know, does she in the, you mentioned the part of the website that keeps a track of the, the kids that pass through it. Do you know what she's doing we, now? We haven't got her now. We oh. haven't got, I haven't, I haven't contacted her yet, but we will, that's a good idea. We should, we should get in touch with Sally. I mean, that's not the end of her story in the Hands Up Project because, I mean, the other thing that we did the next year, <clears throat> we, all of the plays, well, 30 of the plays that were submitted for the competition, we we published them in a book, and it's called Toothbrush and Other Plays. And this has all the plays in there. Um, there's another nice one called My Mother-in-Law is a Troublemaker. That one's um, caught my eye. I put it in <laughs> my copy here. Oh, yeah. you got a copy. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was a really nice thing as well because all the kids. So, next time I went to Gaza, I took all the children who have a play in the book and gave them their own copy. Um, and we've also sold these books all around the world. Um, so, there are other versions of them. And a nice thing, look, I've, this is my own, this is the last copy I've got. And it's, I'll never get rid of this because this has all the kids who acted in it have written things, um, comments to me about the experience. And, and um, so we took them to the West Bank. So this was the first time they'd left Gaza as the prize because they came third in the competition, the first place, second place and third place. We took them to the West Bank and they performed their plays in theatres in Bethlehem and in the Freedom Theatre in Janine. And it was a fantastic experience. And that's that's another kind of moment there that will always stay with me because it's sitting in this bus and we're all traveling from Bethlehem 
to Janine in the north of Palestine. And this is the first time that these girls have left Gaza. And it's the first time they've seen hills, mountains. Gaza's very, very flat. And as we were in this bus winding through the hills on our way to Janine, she was singing um, the Michael Jackson song, um, Heal the World. And I just took a video of her doing that. And it was just, I don't know, it's just sort of quite tear jerking moment to, to experience that with those girls. Very humbling to. Uh, be with them experiencing the other half of their country that they haven't been able to go to before. It's unfathomable, isn't it? And I'd never thought of the size of it being the size of Isle of Wight and two and a half million people in yeah. one area. Quite incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really why the Hands Up project has been so, um, it is so important to so many people in Gaza because it's just a way of connecting to the outside world and that's been denied to so many people. Um, so, yeah. Um, and that, the story of Saleh kind of ends there i mean it doesn't end there but her involvement in the hands up project kind of ended there she went mm -hmm. off to the ministry school and started preparing for her exams but the story of the play didn't end there so because these plays are in the book um when covid happened so at that point kids were very good at performing plays through Zoom. They became the experts in the world at performing plays through Zoom. Um, and we actually made it a rule for the second year that we ran the competition that they had to do it in one take. They couldn't edit the, vi the play at all. They couldn't do any editing. They just had to do it in one take. Um, and if they made a mistake, they'd have to do it again. And this was because, well, partly because we felt it was better for language learning if they did it in one take because they'd have to improvise if they forgot the lines or they'd have to learn the lines really well. They couldn't just like, I mean, the first year we ran the competition, we noticed, we thought, wow, some of these plays are amazing. But when we actually met the kids, we realized what they'd done was they just learned that one line really well and then recorded it and then done another bit and put it all together and edited it very cleverly um, <laughs> which is great in terms of filmmaking but it's not so great in terms of language learning um, and also the rule of no editing meant um, that these plays could be performed through zoom mm. so but then covid happened and lockdown happened like and all the schools were closed. And there was, there, you know, there was no, uh, you know, it's really difficult to do remote theatre because they couldn't get together. So then we decided um, we'd kind of recreate, recreate remote theatre and what we call lockdown theatre, which was just like one student per camera. So we said, this year, students have got to do it from their own homes. They've got to do a play from this book. And um, that's my doorbell ringing now. But hopefully George will answer it. He's not in the shower. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, you know, this, this was the... Um, so we made them... We asked them to create a play from this book or recreate it as lockdown theatre and a very very creative teacher in Gaza called Hannah Mansour you know people in Palestine they never take the easy route with anything <laughs> we could have just done it with all her students in the class just done the play 
from their own homes. But what she decided to do was contact people that she knew in Argentina, Romania, and Spain, and make a version of it where they were all acting from their own homes. So the the boy in the top left corner there is, I um, can't remember his name, but he's in Argentina. The two girls on the right, top right, are from Gaza. Bottom left, he's in Spain, Alejandro. And Daria, I think her name is, is in Romania. And they rehearsed this, they practiced it, and they eventually performed it through Zoom live. That's three different time zones. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a great it's a great piece of theatre. Um, and I said, you know, before that often things that we do in the Hands Up project, they come out of an idea or out of a mistake. So because Hannah decided to do that, do it internationally or interculturally, the next year we thought, okay, we'll do it, we'll make that a rule. So the next year, um, oh, no. <laughs> I think it's a video, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next year we said it's got to be a rule that you can have two or three students in Palestine and they've got to work with two or three students in one other country and do a play from our second book called Welcome to Earth. So these are more plays created by Palestinian kids. Um, so this video that you're about to see is actually the winner of the competition and it was performed by uh, three girls in Gaza and two girls in the Czech Republic and it's about a group of aliens who land on earth in their spaceship and they they're quite excited to land on earth and they go around and look at all the things on earth and they're really disappointed and they come back because they realize, you know, Earth has masses of wars and it has poverty and it has masses of pollution and all the problems. And then they've got to make a decision. Are they going to stay on Earth or are they going to go? And they decide to stay and make it a better place. So it's a beautiful, beautiful day. So this excerpt is actually, rather than giving you the story, there's a little leading and a little musical part they do to give you a flavor, but the, the actual dialogue, because it was, I think it was seven minutes long, we've just got a very short excerpt from it. This is it. Hey, hey, Earth, Earth, the beautiful blue planet. And now let's see, what should we do? <clears throat> I love the energy in it. I mean, you know, when we think about online work, we're often sort of thinking of it being quite a static thing or, you know, words. But look how physical that is. And I love the fact that they're kind of improvising as well. They're all just turning off and turning on their cameras. And it's a, it's a beautiful play, very positive play as well. And um, that play was actually performed when IATEFL was in Belfast, which was, was that last year? I think it was. Yep. Yeah, it was last year, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we actually hired a cinema, a small cinema in Belfast, and we showed some plays, the videos of the plays, but we actually live linked to two girls in the Czech Republic and the two girls in, and three girls in Gaza and they performed it live. 
and it's something really it's something i don't know what it is but people said to me afterwards um it's actually better watching it live than watching it watching the recording i mean you do a lot of live stuff don't you jamie what what is that about live why is it more interesting to see something live being performed live than than a video Ah, there just must be a feeling of immediacy and closeness to the performer. I mean, things get separated in space and time, but this, at least this one does, the time is, is there's no separation. Uh, difficult to yeah. say, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's also partly about, like, you know that at any point something could go wrong. And also something could go <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> it's, there's a kind of edginess about it isn't it when it's live mm. um yeah so that play um that play went on um you know we 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 did the next year we did the competition we kept that rule again and we we made it that it had to be a collaboration between people in different countries and we're actually running now. We, we've decided we're not going to do competitions anymore. We're a bit, a bit burnt out with competitions, but we're not. We haven't stopped doing intercultural remote theatre. And every Saturday evening at um, five o'clock Spain time, four o'clock UK time, we have this intercultural remote theatre link-up idea. So anyone can come, teachers can come, they can bring their students. We've upped the age limit for kids participating to 18. So it's like, you know, anyone between the age of 11 and 18 can come along and we'll put you into groups with a teacher, a remote volunteer, a remote theatre specialist and help you to create a play. I mean, we do a lot of kind of drama, remote theatre games and things as well. So if anyone would like to participate in that, if you'd like to just come along as a teacher and just observe, or you'd like to bring some kids, you're very welcome to drop in. Just send us an email at info at hands up project and, um, and you'll be able to, uh, we'll send you the link for that. So yeah, now we keep changing. Oh my God. Oh my gosh, it's six. What's up? Off. No, is it all right if we go on a bit, Jamie? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's six o'clock. Six o'clock in England. Do you know what happens at six o'clock? Um, six o'clock, the mummies and daddies will take them home to bed. Oh, yeah. Because they're tired little teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking, first thing I thought of was Cracker Jack. But that was. <laughs> Five, five yeah. to five. Five to five, yeah. Yes. Um, so I have I feel proud of what we've achieved in Hands Up. I feel proud of the fact that we've you know we've supported so many young people. I feel proud of the fact that there are connections all around the world. Um but I've also sometimes wondered about all the other kids. Now, not everyone can participate in a play. Not everyone has a high enough level of English to participate in a play. I just want to share with you some of the situations um, that we're working with in Palestine. So this is um, a class in a government school in Gaza and it's a girls school and they're 13 14 years old with their teacher and there are 50 girls in the class and that's normal for a government school to have 50 students in a class Here's a boys school similar situation now in a class of 50 students um, we can't all be doing remote theater and it's also challenging to do link ups and things like that or to certainly to to manage it 
what benefit is everybody getting from one or two students coming up and talking to the webcam? Um, so, and on top of that, I don't know, I felt a little bit uh, frustrated with sometimes with with the materials that are used, not because there's anything wrong with the materials, but it's just so difficult to use materials like this in a context like this. So, you know, Palestine has a course book, English for Palestine, and it's like pretty much any other course book. Um, it was originally published by Macmillan, but it's now... Um, administered by the Ministry of Education and you know it's like it's like any context specific course book anywhere in the world and it has tasks in it like this kind of thing you know the sort of personalized speaking tasks to get students to use particular areas of language work in pairs talk about people you know ask and answer questions I'm sure people recognize that from course books that you work with in your own context that kind of activity does your dad always watch the sport on tv yes he often does or no he doesn't very often so it's an activity to practice um present simple um and with adverbs of frequency i guess but i just think to do that in a class of 50 there's a number of problems. Like, I mean, you work in pairs. Well, first of all, you've got 25 pairs then. So everybody's working in pairs. You've got 25 pairs doing that activity. How do you make sure they're all actually doing it? Um, how can you monitor that? How can you, um, how can it be motivating too? For students who've never left the Gaza Strip to be talking to somebody in exactly the same context as them, is it going to be motivating to talk about, you know, their daily routine, these kind of things? Um, and I also think there's a problem, you know, as you everyone knows, like if you've got a class of 50 students, you're going to have some students who are really high level. And some who are who have no English whatsoever, and so you've got to be really think carefully about who's going to be together in those pairings. Um, so, one thing we've tried to do in the Hands Up project is to try to address as a way of trying to address that issue, or a way of trying to kind of bring an intercultural element into the course book was to do link ups with these classes. And when we started, we were kind of thinking, what are we doing? Can we actually do a link up in a class of 50? Because before that, a lot of our link ups were kind of extracurricular things, the things that happened after class with small groups of motivated learners. But we wanted to make it, we wanted to try and be a bit more mainstream and be really focusing on the course book and trying to fit into their normal classes. So it wasn't, I mean, teachers are very overworked in Palestine. Not everybody wants to stay behind for an hour after school and do an English club. So we wanted to see what impact there could be if we fit it, if we put it into the regular classes. So we decided to research this and we had uh, two boys classes of 50 and two girls classes of 50. And they all took part in weekly online link ups with me. So for 40 minutes, they have, they have five 40 minute classes a week. For one of those 40 minute classes a week, they linked to me and we kind of tried to sort of interculturalize the course book. And then we had a kind of good situation really to do research because those same teachers who taught those classes with me 
they also taught a, a similar class, exactly the same age, same school, same materials. The only difference was that they didn't link to me. So we could kind of do some research in that situation. So we did a questionnaire and we asked them about how much they enjoyed going to English classes before we did the intervention and afterwards. And this is the kind of thing that we did. I think it's the video next, isn't it, Jamie? Is this right? is you having a conversation with Bader. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So are we gonna we can play a little bit of it, can't we? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so maybe, go on. Okay, I'll, just, I'll play what you've given me, yeah? Yeah. I'll just introduce it a little bit. So as I said, we were trying to see if we could support the weaker students in the class, you know, the ones who sit at the back of class and don't always participate, don't put themselves forward. And sometimes even the teacher might overlook those students because there's a sort of tendency that we're sometimes all guilty of, of just going with whoever answers first, you know, you... You pick those people. So this was a student who was one of the weakest in the class. And we were doing an activity where it was a unit in the course book called Friends. And a lot of the activities were about describing somebody that you know really well, talking about feelings and emotions to describe people, usually. Um, and... So I'd ask them to, for homework, I'd ask them to prepare to talk about someone they knew really well. And we'd had lots of people, no, somebody they cared about, not somebody they knew really well necessarily, somebody they cared about. And we'd had a lot of people coming up to the webcam and reading things out loud. You know, they'd sort of prepared to talk about Yasser Arafat, or they prepared to talk about a famous uh, uh, traveler from Palestine or something like that, but they were reading it. And I did feel, I felt a little bit frustrated with that because partly because I felt sometimes students were using language that they weren't really, they didn't really own. They weren't familiar with it. Didn't know how to pronounce the words. They possibly didn't even know the meaning of those individual words. And also because it wasn't it wasn't personalized in the same way. So when Badr came up, um, he brought his paper with him and he was going to talk about his granddad. He showed the picture of his granddad. And this was another landmark moment in Hands Up because the teacher in the room with them, Hussam, who's a brilliant teacher, he said to um, Badr, don't read it, just, um, just say what you can about your granddad. Don't, don't read it, just say it. And Badr was initially quite nervous because he was sort of, oh my God, I've prepared to talk about, I've written it down, I know what to say, but now I've got to spontaneously talk. But he did it. He did it. He's not the best student in the world. His English is quite low level, but he manages to communicate something. So maybe we can just play a little bit of that. Okay. That's all right, Jamie. Without reading, some small points, few points about him. Uh, he uh, he is uh, it's, it's named Badr. Badr. Uh, Badr. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, and uh, he he from uh, is Palestine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, he 
هي سبن children six girls and one and one boy okay he he passed in he passed in away in 2018 okay i'm sorry i'm very sorry i'm sorry is he your is he your father's father or your mother's father Father's or mother's father? Uh, father's uh, father. Your father's father. And um, uh, what was what was his job? What was his job? Um, um, the teacher uh, maths. He was a maths teacher, really. Wow. In a school. For children. Yes. Yes. That's great. That's great. Show me a picture of him, please. Can you show me the picture of him? Can you show me the picture of him? Wow. He he looks so nice. He looks such a nice man. He looks so kind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let me tell you what I remember about your grandfather. You tell me if I'm right, okay? So he was... <laughs> Hi, Jamie. I was trying to signal to stop. Uh, I saw you in the end. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I... There's something, I mean, it's quite slow, but there's something I quite, you know, that you notice about it, that he's really sort of on the edge of his abilities there, isn't he? He's, you can see him thinking, you can see him really trying to find the words, he's getting support from the teachers. And it's interesting too, that in the beginning, there's a lot of background noise. All the other kids aren't really focusing on what he's doing, but we didn't see the whole video but at the end he gets a huge round of applause from everyone <laughs> in his class and he's you can see him kind of feeling more and more confident and more and more proud of what he's done which is i mean it's a very simple thing he's just talked about his granddad as someone in another country but that's what we learn languages for really isn't it to talk about things that mean something to us um it's probably but, one of the first moments of communication real communication in english yeah that he'd ever had had to experience exactly. and take, yeah exactly and that in fact that's what he said afterwards he said that was how did he word it he worded it in an interesting way because we did some interviews with them afterwards and asked them what they felt about it and he said he said something like um, this was he felt like he was spending time with English, which is an interesting kind of way of phrasing it. Like he's kind of spending time with English, almost like he's having a relationship with English, going on a date with English almost, you know, like it's starting to get a relationship with the language rather than just seeing it as loads of rules and things that you've got to learn. So, as I said, we were researching this and we were looking at, um, so we looked at confidence and enjoyment of English classes. And there was a big change in both those things. Um, so they did the same questionnaire, at the beginning, and the end of the study. It was only two months that we did it for. There were only eight sessions. 
And in that table there, oh no, in that table. Um, so I mean, something that often people say to us about Hands Up Project, you know, people who would like to criticize what we're doing. Always are people who want to criticize what you're doing and it's possibly quite a good thing sometimes because it makes you reevaluate what you're doing sometimes. So sometimes we're criticized for people say, oh, you, uh, uh, hands up link ups only work for the high performing students. Well, this is the change in enjoyment. The, the white, what, white ones are the control group. Those are the students who didn't take part in hands up sessions. And the orange ones are the ones who did. To the left, it's the lowest band in, according to the test. They also did an English test at the beginning of the study and at the end. So in, in terms of the English test, um, all of the hands up, all of each fifth of the students, the lowest level fifth and the highest level fifth, um, increased their enjoyment as a result of doing hands up sessions. <laughs> they increased their enjoyment of the sessions. So that means even the, I mean, they didn't increase their enjoyment as much as the highest level ones, but even the ones at the bottom of the class, they increased their enjoyment as well. Wow, Hussam was your student 15 years ago. I didn't know that, Ashraf. Mm. Um, so, um, but it's interesting as well that the con control groups actually went down in enjoyment. Is that because they knew that the 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 hands up project sessions were taking place and they felt that well left out possibly it could be but we don't we we we're not sure if they knew they probably did they probably it's probably impossible to keep it quiet but it could mm. also be that they did quite a hard exam at the end of the period everyone did quite a hard exam so that the effect of that was mitigated by the hands up sessions you know so everyone possibly felt quite demotivated at the end of term they've just done a um you know the the difficult exam now this graph we're just going to show you one more graph i think this is even more interesting this because you know another criticism that's often levied at us is well, it's okay for the people who come up and interact with you, but what about all the others? What about all the other students in the class? They're not having an opportunity to speak. Are they going to improve in their enjoyment as well? And that's, that's going to take a bit of explaining, probably, because I didn't understand it when, I, when it was first sent to me. But... We went through all the videos and counted the number of times each student came up and interacted with me. All right, so along the bottom is the number of interactions. So here we've got a student who interacted uh, 15, 16, what's that, 18 times, something like that. 17 times some students who interacted 17 times here we've got students who didn't interact at all in the eight eight um sessions at no point did they come up and speak to me at the webcam but look that's kind of interesting isn't it <laughs> they their enjoyment went up even though they didn't inter interact with me. In fact, this makes me smile. The only ones who their enjoyment went down, that's zero. The only ones who, whose enjoyment went down were the ones who interacted with me a lot. 
<laughs> and, uh, I see that now because that there's two little dots at the very yeah. the far right. Yes, I hadn't seen that. So that's below. So they are below zero. Yes. So they were actually they enjoyed their classes less at the end of the study than they did at the beginning. It's only a very small change, but but I mean all of the others improved and and that i don't know i think that's i think that's really interesting because i don't know about you jamie but sometimes i feel in elt this is a ma massive generalization i'm about to make Go for it. i feel sometimes we're obsessed with pair work we're obsessed with, oh, it's a fantastic class. If everybody's talking, everyone's talking. So it must be an amazing class. We've got 50 students and they're all talking to each other. But we don't care about what they're actually talking about, whether they're being challenged, whether they're learning anything, whether they're actually, they might not even be talking in English in, that, in those activities. Well, I never did, but I was like having French at school. Yeah. Any single pair work activity meant instantly don't you don't have to do anything. You just mess around. Yeah. Monitor the teacher. The teacher's supposed to be monitoring to you. You're monitoring where the teacher was so that if she or he is suddenly in your vicinity, then you pretend that you're supposed to be doing whatever it was. But exactly. it was ne never, not once, not once throughout my entire time. Even when I was doing, even when I was doing a bit older and I was supposed to know better. Yeah. And why would you? Why would you want to talk about your father? How much your father watches sport? Why would you want to? Exactly. And using often, and does he always? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why? <laughs> why yeah, would yeah. You? So but, I, I yeah. think we've spoken about this a few times before, and I, I know that we concur. In certain, yeah, but it's interesting, things. isn't it? Just the fact if you could suddenly talk to somebody in another country in a completely different context about that topic, it might just make it a bit more interesting. Mm. And Absolutely. also, I just wonder sometimes whether those students who aren't talking, maybe they're learning more than the ones who are. Because they're <laughs> imagining themselves doing it, thinking, what would I say in that situation? Maybe they're able to notice language more easily because they're not having the pressure of having to speak yes yep do you know richard gallon jamie richard gallon i think i don't think i do do i i know he, i think he used to live in barcelona but i'm imagining you don't know everyone in barcelona right most people but not everyone <laughs> Well, anyway, he did a really interesting study because he he kept a diary of his experiences learning Spanish in a evening school um, in Barcelona, and he said that one of the things he really noticed was when the teacher was correcting other students in the class, when other students in the class were speaking. And he was correct, and the teacher was correcting them or reformulating what they said. He could notice it much better than when the teacher did it to him. Because <laughs> when the teacher did it to him, he was like, "Oh, you know, it's sort of pressure, isn't there?" It's kind yes. of it can be quite sort of threatening in a way when somebody reformulates what you've said, it, it, can't it? And yeah. And but, even, I think you once told me something as well. That 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 doesn't that is really interesting as an observation. It makes it's one of these kinds of makes so much sense. Um, and there's something you once told me, though that um, I mean it's slightly different or off slightly. It's, it's related, but not directly related. But one one of the kids once said to you about why they learn English in the first place. I wonder if you remember telling me this. Yeah. You said that we we like learning English so we can share our stories with the world. I think yeah. you told you said that. Do you remember? Well, I th isn't it interesting. I think that is that was a Palestinian. Um, wasn't that a Palestinian person who said that in in 
Wasn't that when we went to Palestine that somebody said that? Oh, is, is that right? I thought so that came out of the Hands Up project. It was something you told me that they'd said anyway, which I was really like. Yeah, I think it came, it might have, I mean, I probably stole it, but I think it came <laughs> from, I think it came from a Palestinian teacher who said, yeah. why are we teaching English? Why are we learning English? We're learning English so we can tell our stories to the world, which, yeah, which is a good. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nick, it's been, it's been great to catch up and hear what you've been up to and, uh, and see about this research that you've been doing. That is fascinating. I've just realized I'm in the dark, Jamie. You are the profile of a, of a, a criminal interviewing <laughs> you. <laughs> is that better? Yeah, just before you go, tell us your worm story. Do you remember it? Oh, the worm story. I need a worm. <laughs> Run out into your garden. I haven't got a to garden. Get one. Ah, do you really I, want me to tell you the worm story? No, it, it's 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 uh it's putting you in the spot. I don't mind. That's all right. But I do need a worm for it. Well, what you need is a worm substitute is a cable for your yeah. um, charger I, an I, iphone charger yeah okay nick what nick first did this story in he, i remember i remember him doing this on video he did this he did this in a live video link up we were in when we were back there in 2012 and nick was um we, we actually did a conference um on video from west bank <clears throat> to Gaza so and um, we never I never made it to Gaza as Nick has done but uh, we did this little conference to a number of Gaza teachers and uh, and Nick told a story about a worm and it's always stuck with me and that's why I've uh, I'm asking requesting it now take it away Nick let's hear oh, your story well, it's actually two worms I've actually had to go and find two worms which I <laughs> luckily happened to find in my um hallway just out there right okay so once upon a time a long time ago um a worm popped out of the soil on a beautiful spring day <laughs> beautiful spring day um and smelt the flowers and was feeling so wonderful because it was spring and everything was growing and there was beautiful smells in the air and then suddenly just when the worm thought it couldn't get any better another worm popped out of the soil Works better with <laughs> real worms, I can tell you. <laughs> Bit more cruel. <laughs> and the first worm looked at the second worm and fell deeply and passionately in love with the second worm. And the second worm looked at the first worm and fell deeply and passionately in love with the first worm. And the first worm got down on his knee you know worms have knees, right? <laughs> First one got down on his knee and said, Titsao Gini, which means will you marry me? It was a bilingual worm, which means will you marry me in Arabic? The second worm said, well, I do love you, but I cannot marry you. I cannot marry you. Maybe you'd like to write in the chat if there's anybody still here. <laughs> <laughs> Why couldn't the second worm marry the first worm? And that's I a think good... we, I think I, I know. I remember you told the story in Arabic as well. It was one of our first stories you told in Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, tell us why. Well, 
the second one said, I do love you, but I cannot marry you because I am your tail. <laughs> yeah, it does work very well. It works well with a, I wonder if you all saw that coming. It works well with a real worm, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a piece of string a shoelace yeah. would be good a shoelace mm. or a very skinny long sausage yes <laughs> yeah already uh, already married yes yeah, sorry <laughs> yeah. hello kate hello pia so it's been really nice to see um some of the, the the hands up project um volunteers here coming in from from gaza i think you said when you said yeah. hello to them, Nick, they're from Gaza. So but it was lovely yeah. to, to, to see you here. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for all uh, for coming and uh, spending this time with Nick and I and all of us. Going to give Nick the last word. Last word to you, Nick. Um, if anybody anywhere in the world would like to get involved with the Hands Up Project, please do. We would love, we love having volunteers all around the world. You could connect to a group of kids and tell a story to a group of kids in Gaza or anywhere else in Palestine. If you want to bring some kids along to um, the intercultural remote theater sessions, or if you just want to come along yourself and help out, if you're interested in remote theater, just come along. You can just watch it if you want and see what happens. Um, then just send us an email info at handsupproject.org so great that's it Website. thank you very much thank you very much jamie for inviting me it's, thank you nick it's been a big pleasure as always it's just I'm been like hanging out with you i'm uh, sorry i did it all in the dark i really just thought i was kind of thinking why is it so difficult to see me i just realized <laughs> that it was sort of getting dark but <laughs> Ah, oh, thank you all so much. Been great to great to have you here. And thanks once more time, one more time to Nick. And you have a have a great evening, and uh, see you at the next one. All right, bye bye. Bye.